Hello, everyone. How's everybody doing? Numbers are going up. Hello, Lisa from Moose Jaw. It's nice to have you online with us. <laughs> oh, I'm jealous, Tracy, from your deck and lane, right? No fun at all. <laughs> And hello from Colorado Springs. How was the weather there? Hi, Rachel. Oh, wow. People I'm from Lisa. All right. Well, it's two o'clock. So, oh, it's nice from BC, too. So straight across Canada and in the U.S. as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. For some of you, perhaps this morning or just noon, I guess, in, in B.C. Crazy weather over the past few days, but today is beautiful. Yeah, in Winnipeg, it's been rainy and windy and interesting. Today, it's right now is sunny, but windy. So... <laughs> um, this week actually is bike to it's a bike week in Winnipeg, so all things bike are happening this week, which is kind of fortuitous. Uh, today is bike to takeout day, I guess. So we're supposed to bike to to wherever we get our food. So sushi tonight. We're gonna bike to the sushi place. Bike it home into the wind. It'll be great. <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to this this session on uh, getting race ready and using tech because I am not very tech savvy as it comes to uh, using things, and I'm sure I could be using a lot more technology to help me with my um, with my biking for sure, and perhaps even with although I don't run, but with my um, the walks that I do and and that type of long distance training that I've been doing. So I'm really excited to have Sean here today. Uh, let him introduce himself, but really excited to have him here. Uh, for those of you who have never been on a webinar with me, my name is Diane Bryan. I'm from uh, 17 Wayne, Winnipeg. I'm the manager of health promotion there. Over to you, Sean. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean, like Diane mentioned, and I'm one of the several uh, fitness and sport instructors at the 17 Wayne Canadian Airport base. All right. So we will be um, using the chat box to talk. Hello from Borden as well in Trenton. Nice to see you guys. Well, not really see you guys, but read you guys. <laughs> All right, we're going to be um, turning off our, our um, cameras and uh, we'll just be paying attention to the, um, the PowerPoint. For the rest of the rest of the time, the question is number two of a series of sessions we have on getting race ready. So last week we looked at goal setting. This this week we're going to look at how tech can help us perhaps improve our um, our training. So before I get started, just wanted to let you know that this. Per presentation that you're about to view is the intellectual property of the Department of National Defense. Any reproduction or retransmission of the slides contained in this presentation is strictly forbidden. So some of the topics discussed in this webinar may be of a sensitive nature. Some of the some of the technology that we're going to be talking may not be suitable for children. So just we ask that you use your parental discretion if you've got kids around you and, and are looking at uh, and they're watching this webinar with you. Please understand as well that the people's stories are their own to tell and that anything that is shared by participants in this webinar and the chat box uh, is not to be discussed outside this webinar. And we will be using the chat box only. We will not be uh, turning on mics or cameras for, other, for the participants. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the PSP YouTube channel. Though active participation is encouraged, you can, you can simply follow along using the chat function um, without using the chat function if you would prefer. We don't mind. All right. 
So we're going to do a poll. So let's find out what your affiliation is. So the poll, for those of you new to the webinar, the polls are up the top. So you can just, uh, top of the chat box, you'll find the slot for tolls, for polls. So very nice, a good cross section of the community. So some serving members, some veterans, family members, civilian employees, and even a couple others. So that's very nice to see, great. All right, Sean, over to you. Okay, so we're talking about training gadgets and technology today. So in this slide here, I put up a few different examples of uh, some training technology we'll be talking about. In the top uh, left corner uh, with the polar sign on it, that is a heart rate monitor strap. And that basically goes around the chest to measure heart rate monitor while you exercise. Right under that would be a power meter for cycling and it measures watts or how much power. And cyclists actually have an edge when it comes to training, when it comes to watts. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more as well. In the middle, you have your phone. So your phone's a really vital piece of equipment nowadays when it comes to training, because there's tons of different apps you could use to help track your progress. And then as well, there's like watch smart watches, there's Fitbits, there's a uh, wrist strap heart rate monitors that use what's called plasmography which basically puts light waves into your skin and sees, and it can predict how, or it can see how uh, fast your heart is beating based on the blood flow. Um, so before I get started uh, with this conversation about training gadgets and the apps and stuff like that, I would like to ask the chat, uh, what kind of technology or gadgets do you currently use to help your training or to make exercise a little bit more enjoyable? It could be apps you use that you like, the Apple Watch, the Garmin. Yeah, I know Garmin has a lot of uh, kind of like watch accessories now. I know they used to just be GPS technology, but now they're really going over to the watches now and they have GPS watches. Map My Run is a very good app and it's an example I'll be going back to quite often. So phone apps, GPS, and when it comes to running and cycling, the phone apps and the GPS are really, really good to use because not only you could track your uh, distance you're going, but uh, it also tracks your pace as well. Something that you don't really get if you're just pre-roading your runs and knowing your pace is huge when it comes to making progressions. That's something we'll also talk about as well. So I'm not gonna talk about any specific type of apps just because there is a lot of apps. If you search up fitness or exercise in the Google Play Store, the Apple Store, um, you're gonna get a load of different options. And in my personal opinion, you would wanna pick something that works best for you. Um, so some examples I found in terms of apps, there's Map My Run and Map My Ride, which are really good apps for running and cycling respectively. Then there's all the uh, typical uh, health apps like Samsung Health, Google Fit, Apple Health which uh, track your steps and you could usually like uh, get your heart rate too with your phone. Um, yeah, another example I had was Strava Tracker for uh, cycling as well. But yeah, there is a lot of different apps out there. There's all trails for hiking. There's apps for CrossFit workouts, apps for bodybuilding workouts, powerlifting workouts, gender specific apps, weight loss apps, walking apps, meal planner apps. There's apps for six pack abs. There's apps for training your arms. There's yoga for kids, fitness for kids. There's even a zomb uh, an app called Zombies Run, which is a zombie apocalypse running app, <laughs> which I'll talk about in a little bit. There's yoga apps. There's even role-playing game apps relating to fitness and dating sim apps. So really uh, choose what motivates you the most and kind of like gets your gears going the most. So I'm not gonna go over any specific apps, but most of the uh, technology we talk about will work with those with those types of apps. And why is there so many apps? Because there's potential to make tons of money. Your market is everyone with a phone. <laughs> so wherever there's a niche, there's gonna be uh, software. 
So if you remember from last week, we talked about goal setting and one of the big things we talked about were smart goals, so specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. We could relate this to using technology as well. So for specific, technology allows you to set specific workout goals and make appropriate progressions. Most fitness apps will also have workout plans and progressions specific to your fitness level, age, gender, and can also be very fun. So like I mentioned before, there's that app called Zombies Run, in which while you're running, you listen to stories in a post-apocalyptic zombie world while running. Uh, that app has progressions, so you slowly build up. So it'll start you at somewhere from 33 kilometers to 30 minute runs, and it'll eventually progress you to something like 10K runs in a really in a really evidence-based manner. You get rewards for completing runs, and you get add to your zombie base and so on. So there's tons of different apps uh, to help make your training a bit more specific. Second part point is the M. This is probably the most important uh, point for using technology. It allows you to measure and analyze your progress. And that's basically what tech for running and cycling is used for. So that's why M is the most important here. Whether it's your Fitbit, heart rate monitor, phone GPS, power meter on your bike, all of this hardware's primary purpose is to measure your workout volume, your workout intensity, and your workout frequency. We'll get back into more detail on why this is uh, so, so important later on. Third point is A attainable. The real-time feedback uh, from technology allows you to train at the best intensity for yourself. I myself need this feedback as I'll always start running and cycling gun-ho and gas out very quickly within five minutes. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever do that where you start running and you go really hard and then you just gas out and have to start walking after like five minutes and then you usually end up quitting, which I have done in the past. If I have that feedback, for example, a heart rate monitor, I'm able to quickly change my intensity uh, to match to match my speed and last longer. And that's what uh, technology can help out with. And then there's R, realistic. Technology gives real-time feedback on your work with new capabilities. Sometimes I like to tell myself that I could run faster than I actually do, or that I could cycle harder than something I actually do while training. Technology keeps your ego in check as the real-time feedback allows to more accurately depict what is reasonable and what is not in terms of how fast you're going. And then time-bound. So many apps and technologies have programs with program programmable start and end dates for the training regimens. Like I mentioned, the Zombie Run app uh, or Zombies Run app usually has eight-week programs and it progresses you in a timely fashion so you don't get injured. Go to the next slide now. So like I mentioned earlier, the primary uh, function of training technology is to measure and analyze your workouts. That gives you some more specific data uh, to help you with future training progressions. Also, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, if my uh, mic is too quiet or too loud, just mention and I could uh, get closer to my laptop here. Training technology allows you to answer questions such as, is my performance improving? Am I doing better than last week or last year? Am I getting closer to my goals or goal? Am I working too hard, which uh, could lead to overtraining, overreaching, and ultimately burnout? Or am I not working hard enough so you're not getting enough volume or intensity to stimulate adaptations? Training technology could help answer all of those questions. Awesome. Thanks, Leona. So this discussion will have some overlap with future presentations including the tracking your progress and revising your goal, which is on the 22nd of July, as well as stepping up training on the 19th of August and possibly other future presentations. So I'm gonna keep some of the information on the lighter side as it's gonna be presented in the future, but feel free to ask questions if you're total keener on the topic. I've left a lot of time open to answering questions and stuff for this presentation. So feel free to ask something, even if it is a lengthy question. So to understand the importance of training technology, I'll have to touch on progressive overload, overreaching, overtraining, and finally burnout. The graph on the left that uh, you've shown here, it has progress time and plateau, uh, is used to de demonstrate progressive overload. The y-axis or the vertical axis as in, uh, is progress, as in your running pace or your cycling place, pace, sorry, not place, 
and then the x-axis or the horizontal axis is time. When you begin training, you'll see progress as your body adapts to a training stimulus. Your body will stop adapting as it gets used to the training load. So you have to keep adding more and more and more volume uh, every single week in a slow, gradual fashion to continue to adapt. Otherwise, plateaus will occur, which is what's occurring in the graph on the left. You see progress, but if you don't increase the training load, you hit a plateau. Training devices such as workload apps that use GPS. So under that graph on the left is a screenshot from Map My Run. These will fairly reliably track your running or cycling pace, which is also known as intensity, how long you run or cycle, also known as your volume, and then the frequency of your session. So that's easier to track, but, the, but these apps will also tell you how many times you're training a week and whether that moves up and down as you progress. Using this information, you can track how quickly you are progressing and whether you're hitting a plateau and need to increase the intensity or volume. So say for example, week after week after week, uh, you're not seeing any progress. An app will tell you that, that you're not getting faster, you're not getting better. So you, that could be due to burnout or it could be that you're not adding enough. The graph on the right is a representation of what could happen if you aren't training hard enough or you're training too hard. The y-axis is performance or how well you are doing in terms of pace. And the x-axis is training load or how much volume or frequency you're actually doing. If your progress plateaus, it may be due to overreaching and overtraining and your body is screaming for a deload or a taper. So training apps, really good training apps will tell you if you're starting to train too hard or if your progress is starting to tank. And that will usually be when you're, uh, when you need a deload or a taper. So many apps, like there's a powerlifting app, if any of you are weightlifters or powerlifters, uh, by Shiko, who's a Russian strength coach, and the app is actually reciprocal. So if you start losing progress, the app will actually make you take a deload, and some apps actually have that. But you could also monitor yourself uh, on the running apps, like Map My Run, is my progress getting better or no? So closely monitoring your workouts with technology in terms of pace, time, frequency, intensity will allow you to avoid plateaus and ultimately avoid injury. So once again, more information on training strategies and stepping up your training will be provided in later presentations, but feel free to ask us or uh, email us, email me if you want more information on that stuff right now. So that's that slide. I know it's a lot of information, but does anyone have any questions about progressive overload, overreaching, overtraining and burnout? I'll just wait like 30 seconds or so because I know there is a delay between me talking and it actually reaching you all. <laughs> all right. Well, if anyone does have a question, I'll get back to it. I'm keeping a close eye on the chat. So now uh, that we understand why and how training tech can be so beneficial to training, we'll move ahead on ahead to some specific types of training tech uh, commonly used. So at the top of the slide again, I once again have the chest strap, a Fitbit, and a phone. The waist monitor, or the chest strap, uses electrodes to detect heart rate, much like electrocardiography just not as advanced as those seven electrode or 12 electrode systems you see in a health setting. It just uses two electrodes usually and goes on the center of your chest. Um, some newer monitors, a heart rate monitors such as the Fitbit use photoplasmography. So photo, light, phlebonomics, I think is uh, relates to uh, blood and then graphy, the measurement of. So it basically uses uh, light to detect uh, or it measures the wavelengths of light that your blood gives off as it pumps through your arteries and veins. And that's how it detects your heart rate. Heart rate is also a great progress tool. Phones also, sorry, before I get to that, uh, phones also have a heart rate monitor, but they're pretty hard to use while you're running. You want an active heart rate while you're running. 
The phone is pretty tough to use. You can usually get your heart uh, resting heart rate or post exercise heart rate, but it's not really a tool for heart rate. I just have it up there because most phones do have a heart rate monitor. Heart rate is also a great progress tool. As you may notice, your heart rate uh, will lower for the same pace as you continue to improve. So this gives you a good idea of when you should increase your pace as you continue seeing progress. So a specific example is if I do a run, 5K run in 30 minutes and my average heart rate, heart rate was 170 beats per minute, but then three weeks from now, my average heart rate is 150 beats per minute, but I'm still doing the same time. That means you've made improvements and it's a likely sign that you should probably in start increasing the progress by 10% per week or something like that. Uh, on the bottom of this slide, I have just some an example of how to use heart rate. We have five different training zones here. Some uh, research has five training zones. You could find different examples with more training zones. But overall, the lower training zones are for losing weight. That's where you'd be from 50 to 70% of your heart rate max. The reason why this is a training zone good for losing weight is because you could last a lot longer, which allows you to burn more calories overall. Three moderate or two, three, and four are moderate. So that's more, more so improving fitness. People who are kind of been running for a little while now and want to improve their fitness. So anywhere from 60 to 90% of their heart rate. If you're a real keener, you've been running for a while, you know how to train for competitions. Uh, there are times you'll train at near max heart rate, uh, basically to learn how to be uncomfortable to shuttle lactic acid. But that's what heart rate is, or heart rate monitors are used for, is to track what zone you're training in which really helps with, uh, monitor, once again, monitoring, ma analyzing, measuring your training progress. Going to the next slide now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pros and cons of using a chest strap versus using a Fitbit. I do recommend the chest strap if you can use it, just because it's very accurate. Um, I, it's only one pro, but it is the biggest pro and outweighs everything else. Uh, you want accuracy when it comes to measuring and analyzing your workouts. The more accurate your data is, uh, the better you'll be able to plan for your future in terms of training. The biggest con uh, that I suffer from personally is it has to contact the skin. So I'm sorry, uh, fellow hairy chested people that are watching this. You'll have to shave that area of your chest for it to be accurate and to work well. It's also a little bit less comfortable to wear. Sometimes it's not the not, not the most comfortable thing to wear because it's tighter on your skin. It, it could sometimes create rashes if you're wearing it for long distance runs or if it's humid outside. But I do recommend the chest strap just because it is a lot more accurate in the fitness setting. Um, with the Fitbit or the, the wearables on the wrist, they are more comfortable to wear. They're better fitting and they're usually more phone and app friendly. Um, but it's not as accurate and reliable. It's a new technology and because it moves around so much on your wrist, um, it doesn't accurately grab your heart rate, especially when you're running at higher, higher paces. Uh, it may give you a wrong heart rate during your run, during parts of your run. Um, the technology is fairly new and it probably will become a lot more advanced in the future and accurate in the future. It might even become better than a chest strap at, uh, one day. It just is a fairly new technology still. Yeah, and that's the thing too, right? That's something I personally don't uh, <laughs> don't have to wear, right? So I don't know from like a female's perspective what like uh, how it interferes, but I know it is quite more uncomfortable. Thanks, Leanne. Any questions about heart rate monitors? Oh yeah, and I guess, yeah, it depends on the type of uh, elastic strap you're using too. Maybe you can put it right under and it helps stabilize it actually. I just have a question for everybody. I'd just like to know, do you, so for your, if you're using a Fitbit, your Garmin, Garmin whatever, are you tracking your, do you regularly track your heart rate? I'd just like to put that out to everybody who's online. Yeah, that would be the most important thing about using these wearables is you have an active measurement of your heart rate. So that's the, uh, like with the chest straps, you usually have a watch that's with it. So when you do buy a chest strap, that's something I probably should have mentioned, is you don't just get the chest strap, it comes with a watch and it connects to the watch. So when you're running, 
you can continuously check your uh, watch to see where your heart rate's at. Oh, I'm at 190. That's why I'm gassing out. I'm going to decrease my pace a bit. Look at my heart rate again. Oh, I'm only at 100. Maybe I should kick it up a notch a little bit and increase my pace a little bit. So you get active feedback in terms of how hard you're working. And that's why heart rate is so important. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> there are a few people that are using their technology to, to monitor their heart rate all the time. So. I'm probably not using it to set a heart rate ranges for training properly. I have looked and see then, sorry, I'm just reading this right now. Don't even know how to use the information that, okay. that technology is giving us. Yeah, Kyle, and that's what makes a heart like a heart rate gives us a really good measure in terms of how hard you're working, right? So, looking uh, like in the previous slide, I'll go back to this slide. This is an example of the heart rate zones. So, the zone you train in is dependent on your goals. So, once again, if you want to lose weight, you would go to the one or two for a longer period of time, say like an hour or longer. If you're maximizing performance, you're learning how to shuttle lactic acid a little bit better and in learning to be uncomfortable at a higher pace, you would do 10 to 15 minute runs at maximum at a five or hundred percent heart rate. If you're looking to uh, more so improve fitness overall, cardiovascular conditioning, you would be in that two, three or four zone. Yeah, the watch, uh, and that's the thing with watches, like the, uh, depending on the brand, it might be more or less accurate, depending on how well it fits on your wrist, it might be more or less accurate, but something is still better than nothing. And I think it'll be within the range, plus or minus 20 beats per minute. It will be, it will give you some information on how hard you're working. All right. So if anyone has more questions about uh, heart rate monitors, because I know it's, that's one of the more common uh, pieces of technology that people use, uh, we could go back to that question. I'm going to be talking a little bit, or to that topic, I'm going to be talking a little bit about power meters now. And like I mentioned earlier, cyclists have a little bit of an edge when it comes to measuring the progress, because they get to see how much watts they're generating and not heart rate. So you can measure directly with watts. It's even better than measuring heart rate because watts give you a super accurate representation on how hard you're pushing and it has no confounds. So heart rate can change based on your caffeine intake, sleep, stress, and has many other variables. So if you stop running, your heart rate is still high for another five minutes at least as you recover. Power is immediate. If runners and swimmers could use watts, this would be the golden standard, but unfortunately, uh, it's really hard to track watts for running and for swimming. This is something special that cyclists have. So the purpose of power meters is to measure the work a cyclist is generating in watts. So one watt is one joule per second, or another way to put it is force times distance over time. Force is measured by strain gauges to get torque or Newton meters, that's the force. Distance is measured by accelerometers to get the uh, revolutions per minute. So once again, a lot of technology goes into us into this. Therefore, they're a little bit more expensive. Um, there's various ways or various ways it could be installed in various places on the bike. So there's, there's the crank spider. So the leftmost image, it could be installed on the crank spider or the crank arm, the second image. It could be installed on the pedal. It could be installed in the rear hub. And I'm sure there's other ways too. But prices start around $500 and go upwards of $1,500. So usually if you want something half decent, you're spending $1,500 or more. So that's the only downside is it's uh, it's terribly expensive. And it's something that even I don't use when I uh, cycle just because I'm not that rich. <laughs> if there's any of you that are avid cyclists, and do racing or triathlons or duathlons, 
you probably do have a power meter on your bike or if you are want to get into cycling competitively it's implied you're going to be getting a power meter on your bike so i'm going to touch on the ftp or the functional threshold power this is how you kind of like the heart rate monitor in terms of training zones this is how you figure out your training zones for cycling specifically ftp is a must FTP is the max average watts you can generate while cycling for 60 minutes. So the functional threshold of power is your average watts from cycling as hard as you can for 60 minutes. Now it's very, very tough, very tough to cycle as hard as you can for 60 minutes. So there's a test you could do for 20 minutes. So you cycle at your max power or as hard as you can for 20 minutes. Then you take that average power and multiply it by 0.95, and that would be your FTP, and it's very reliable to the 60-minute test. Your FTP is used to define your training zones. So say, for example, I pedaled as hard as I can for 20 minutes, and I got 300 watts or 100 watts, for just to make it easy for math, that I got 100 watts as my average wattage for that 20 minutes. I multiply that by 0.95, and I have 95 watts. That's my FTP. So just an example, I have the zones here. So this looks very similar to the heart rate training zones. And this is where cyclists have the edge uh, because they can get a lot more specific with their training using the FTP training zones. It works very similarly. So active recovery or zone one would be 55% of your FTP. Um, what's nice too is this chart also has average heart rate. So you can also achieve these zones using heart rate. You don't absolutely need a power meter, but if you want really specific data or data, uh, using a power meter is the golden standard. But 55% would be about 60 watts for me. So if I'm pedaling at 60 watts, that means I'm in the active recovery zone. Uh, physio physiological adaptations are things like blood flow, flushing out, um, like hydrogen ions and lactic acid, like uh, acidity in the, in the blood to help recover. And then there's the other zones. So a lot of training, I won't go through all these zones here, but if you search up FTP training zones, you'll find tons of examples and training is geared around uh, these zones. So if you're more so on the performance end, you're gonna be training in zone six, zone five. If you're training for distance or cardiovascular benefits, once again, you'll be zone two, three, and four. If you're recovering, Say, for example, if you're doing intervals on zone six, you go to zone six, back to zone one, and that power meter will tell you what zones you're in. So I know a lot of you are, or I showed you a lot of equipment that's uh, very expensive. So my next question is, uh, do I really need all of this equipment? And I'll tell you the truth, after explaining all these slides, you honestly don't need any technology to begin training. <laughs> so it kind, of, it kind of feels counterintuitive. Why did I, why did I talk about all this stuff? Uh, I'll, and I'll get to that. You can pre-route your runs. This eliminates the use of a phone GPS or any type of GPS technology. You can use the rating of perceived exertion. So if you don't have heart rate, you don't have a power meter, you could use the RPE to measure intensity. So on the right-hand side, I have the RPE scale of 1 to 10, and then a Borg scale, which is a 6 to 20 scale, more so used in research purposes. And you could use these just as easily to track how hard you're going. So if you're running and you tell yourself you're working at an 18 out of 20, odds are you won't be able to last more than a couple minutes. So then you would decrease your pace. And then I'm running, and I tell myself, I'm honest with myself, I'm running at a 9 or a 10. It's very light. And I've been running for a while. I know I should probably increase that RPE to like a 13 or 14 uh, out of 20. So you could definitely use RPE uh, instead of heart rate as a metric for tracking how hard uh, you are working. So then why use technology? Then why did I go through all of this? Um, tech using technology ultimately takes the guesswork and memory out of tracking progress. So you get a lot more specific data, improved and accurate data, allow better decision making in terms of future training. So if you're a competitive athlete or you're looking to get into the competitive scene, I would say using that te technology, say if you're getting into competitive cycling, uh, power meter, I would say is almost a must. 
which is kind of unfortunate because there is a pay barrier to get into competitive cycling. And then same thing with running, a little bit of a pay barrier, because if you want really accurate information uh, to improve on performance goals, having that heart rate monitor does really help. And that's the only unfortunate thing about it is there is a little bit of a pay barrier. An example I'll give is uh, if you're an international or national level marathon runner, there's Nike shoes that are, I forgot what they're called, but they, they cost around 300 to $400 and they last for two runs and they're not even training shoes. They're the marathon running shoes. And then the training shoes are equally expensive and only last for a few runs. Yeah, the carbon plate. I forgot what they were called. I don't know the specifics, but there is, that's the only unfortunate thing about elite training is there is a bit of a pay barrier to get into it. But other than that, that's all I have to say for technology. Does uh, We could go back to any of the other slides if any of you have any more questions or want to go into further discussion about these things. Does anyone have uh, any questions about training technology? or anything we went over. So I guess we'll quickly review everything we did uh, just in case you had something on your head and you forgot. So we talked about progressive overload, overreaching, overtraining, and burnout. We talked about the heart rate monitors and the type of technology they use. And then the training zones as well. So you, your training zones are based on your training goals. One and two for losing weight, improving fitness is zones two, three, and four. Maximum Maximizing performance is zone four and five where you're working pretty hard. We talked about the pros and cons of both, the uh, wearables. We talked about power meters a little bit and why cyclists have an edge. Yeah, sure thing. What I'll do, let's see if I could do that right now, actually. Oh, no, I don't think I could do that. Um, what I'll do is... Uh, I'll Lisa, if you just email Sean, his email address is on one of the slides. If you email him, he'll send it to you. Yeah. So, yeah, my uh, email is on the slide. Just to send me an email, and I'll send you both those. Uh, I'll make a handout for the heart rate training zones and some good resources. Um, yeah, so the Borg scale, they do use it in the force test. So it's a scale of 6 to 20. Do we want or do we want more or less exertion? So the amount of exertion you're using for the Borg scale depends, once again, on the training zone. So if we look at the Borg scale on the bottom right here, um, if you're more so looking for going longer distance, aka you want to like get more calories and get more energy expenditure out, training at that lower intensity, so you say from like an 8 to an 11, it's going to allow you to last a little bit longer with training. Um, if you're a little more so looking for fitness and seeing the aerobic benefits to training, training at a 12 or higher is where you want to be. And then when it comes to performance or high intensity interval training or intervals while running, you want to be at 17 plus training pretty hard during those active phases and then going low to like an eight or a nine for those recovery phases. Say, for example, if you're doing high intensity interval training, the board scale for the force test is. Whoops, one second. Let me, uh, I messed up my chat here. For training for a marathon, um, that all depends. So, I haven't had many clients like or I, I when I train clients for doing marathon running, um, I will give them an RPE. So depending on the type of aerobic, because marathon runners will do two types of training. They'll do aerobic intervals, anaerobic intervals, or just uh, longer distance runs. So if they're doing anaerobic intervals, they're going to be training, they're going to be doing runs where they run at a higher pace, 17 plus out of 20 for a minute or two, and then they'll rest for a minute. And the times I give them are specific to the fitness level and what they were doing before. Then there's aerobic intervals where you're training maybe out of 15, 14 for a few minutes, and then going down to that eight or nine for a few minutes. And then there's just long distance runs where if, uh, if you're training for a marathon and you have one of those days where you're doing a longer distance run where you're just consistent pace for an hour plus, Possibly training at a 12 or below is where you want to be in order to maintain your pace. But once again, there's so many variables that play a role. 
yeah, long slow distance, you typically want to be a little bit lower on that RPE scale. And once again, RPE scale isn't as reliable just because it's a little bit more subjective. But yeah, if you're telling yourself you're working at a 16, you're doing a long slow distance, you could probably accurately say, I'm not going to last an hour plus training at 16 or 17 or something like that. I hope that answers your question, Lisa. No problem. And then, uh, Randy, in terms of uh, the Borg scale, the force test does use the uh, Borg scale pretty much. It doesn't, uh, they use it for research purposes. So, so all the data or data, I don't know which way to say it, uh, is sent to Ottawa uh, just for research purposes. They want to know how hard CAF members are working on each of the four tasks. Um, that's a different reason they use it. So that's more not that's not for uh, like yourself. It's just more so uh, in relation to the force test for uh, how hard they want to see how hard people are working for the tasks in the force test. But that is the Borg scale. It is the same exact scale. Whoops, went too far. Is there any more questions? So what I'll do is I'll also make a uh, little PDF, just a resource for heart rate training zones. And if anyone emails me, I'll send that uh, resource your way. All right, and I'll hand it back to Diane. All right, thank you. I just uh, I just sent out a, a message to Leona whether or not she wanted to get on and talk at all about um, the the Borg scale with the fit with the um, force test. So I have enabled her mic if she would like to say anything. <laughs> if she wishes not to, she doesn't have to. She can say no. <laughs> no pressure. No problem. All right. So we have a poll. So what I'd like to know is, um, do you feel that you can apply what you've learned today in your daily living? Well, that's not actually what the poll says. How satisfied are you with the daily, with the Demio platform? <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so most of you agree that you can use it. So the next poll is about the Demio platform, sort of the slides are moving ahead and I am not. Okay, and then this one's about how satisfied are you with the Demio platform? All right. Today, technology is not working very well for me. <laughs> that is great. So and just before we finish, I just wanted to quickly go over some of the resources that exist to help people who may be struggling through this time period. So the Canadian Forces Members Assistance Program is always out there for you. It is a referral service, 1-800-365 days of the year. Uh, you call this number and they will refer you to somebody within your community, usually within about a, a, at the maximum 72 hours. So between 24 to 72 hours, you will have somebody in your area that will be able to help you with the issue that you're looking at. Totally free and outside of the chain of command. Canada's suicide hotline is always there for people who are suffering from uh, any mental health issue and, and are thinking of suicide as possibly being an option. So please reach out and talk to somebody. For information on COVID-19, please contact uh, the, go to the source. So Canadian government has the best information and that would be great. Family information line 
is there as well. Another 1-800 um, number that has actual counselors on the line. So anybody can phone this number. Serving members, family members of the serving member, their extended family members, and actually speak to a counselor. So sexual misconduct response center is there for anything uh, sexual misconduct. They can handle that for you. Uh, kids help phone, also a great resource. They also have a parents helpline as well that you can that you can text to to get some information and CAF Kids as well on Kids Help Phone, which is specific to children in the Canadian Armed Forces. And then the ARC line in support of COVID-19 is the Canadian Armed Forces uh, information line about COVID-19. So. All right. Okay, Leona, sorry. Uh, so that's it for our presentation today. What's the email to use for the heart rate tables? I will go back to that slide. There oh. you go. So email John. And he will ensure that you get that information for you. And he's put it in the chat box as well. No problem, Leanne. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Joe. Are there any questions at all? Please feel free to ask. Um, we'll stay on the line for another two or three minutes before we close off the close off the session. And next week's session is on performance nutrition. So ensuring that we're eating right so that we can get reach the goals that we've made for ourselves. Thank, Thank you, you, Lisa. Have a great day as well. Thank you, Rochelle. Well, Leona, I noticed you answered like a question with uh that's why that looked weird in the chat box. Your answer <laughs> oh, okay. I kind of tripped out a little bit because I thought like there's like a box around your chat thing and I thought I messed it up somehow. And I just realized you were answering the question for the Borg scale. I apologize about that. <laughs> I never knew Demio could do that. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know either. That was very cool. Thanks a lot, Rachel. They're highlighted because you're awesome. That's why. <laughs> All right, everybody, as there's no more questions, we're going to close out this session. So thank you very much for joining us and hopefully we'll see some of you next week.